yeah, so we'll do, we'll put, we'll probably put this up as well, but we'll, let's just talk a little bit about the, um, the basics of quantum mechanics. Like, what's a state? It's so like you might see a, a function that looks like this, where we'll have psi, which is some state, and it's usually written like this, where you might have some complex number times a state plus another complex number times another state. But we don't really talk about, we, let, let's talk about what these are. Let's unpack these a little bit. So a state, just the plain definition of a state, it's kind of, an intuitive definition, right? The state of a particle is the way that a particle is. It's it's a vector in a complex vector space. So we're talking about complex numbers here and complex vectors. Um, and that's usually called a Hilbert space. And that describes a particle. So that's, that's what a state is. It's a vector that describes a particle. Um, Let's see here. You're in a state right now, Ohio, Pennsylvania, <laughs> Minnesota. So you guys are naming states. That's good. Yep, you are in states, uh, just like quantum particles. <laughs> so an example of a state, that, a vector that describes something about a particle, might be a spin state or a momentum state, position state. Uh, and usually we write it down the following way. We say there's a ket, and this is Dirac notation. Um, and the cat looks like this, and it's usually just a line, a vertical line with some value inside, and then a, uh, a bracket that closes it down, uh, an angle bracket or whatever they're called. Oh, you're in a swing state. Very good. I'm in a state of denial. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, so now, like, let's unpack this a little bit. So, if we were to say a spin state. In the, uh, if we were to talk about the direction, the z direction, so we'll talk about the z direction as kind of like the main one, um, a, and that's going to be given by uh, a, a cat that might look like that. So that would be spin up in z direction. And we will also call this the z basis, right? So we're going to say that this, now we'll talk about, uh, well, I should be a little bit more specific. We'll talk about the z one the most, and we'll call that the basis. So when we write about the other positions, like x and y, we're going to talk about writing the x and y states in the z basis. So the z is kind of like the primary is this chapter one. chapter one? Yes, Tyrion, this is chapter one. Like I said, I'm loosely following Sakurai, if you guys want to follow along. Um, okay, so if we have Z, and that's the so it's, it's know you are a loose boy. <laughs> I don't. Speaking of drinking early, Tyrion, how are you doing today? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so Welcome to the channel. Z plus <laughs> is a spin up Roosevelt. Thank you for the follow, too. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> Rum and that's a spin up morning. in the z direction. Rum and eggs this morning, yes. Yes, I imagine so. Uh, now, let's see. So you can add states together just like this. So it's perfectly normal to add states together. So instead of adding the z states, let's talk a little bit more generically and say we'll have some alpha state plus some beta state, and that's going to equal some gamma state. So, so states can be added to create new states, and they just... Uh, and like this state is a state that describes both the plus C and the plus and the minus C. The spin up in the Z direction, spin down in the Z direction. So, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so this is the, uh, we can add them together. What else can we do? We can multiply them by numbers, complex numbers or otherwise. Uh, so one thing you could think of would be having a complex number C multiplied by a state. Now, if it's just a number, you can move it around. So it can be written like this as well. Okay? But that's not always the case, as we're soon going to find out. Uh, but numbers, complex numbers, can be multiplied by states. And, like, for instance, when we are in the z basis, if we wanted to write the uh, z in terms of the y states, which you can do, uh, you'll have complex numbers in that system as well. So, uh, numbers can be moved around, but then there's things like operators, where operators cannot be moved around. They are applied to a state on the right hand side, uh, a ket on the right hand side. Uh, but then when they are, usually you get some value if it's an eigen 
state, you usually get some eigenvector value based off of that state. Does this stuff play into quantum entanglement? Yes, quantum entanglement kind of exists in all of this. Um, quantum entanglement is usually between two particles that you can't write separately. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than this if, if we want to do it mathematically, so we won't be getting into that today after all. Um, but yeah, this is all of the cat notation and bra notation, you write quantum entangled particles in that as well. Uh, and then you basically, you uh, the entanglement thing is, is you'll write a state of two particles and you cannot write that state as a sum of separate states. You've got to write them. Uh, <clears throat> build up what you mean by states first and then we'll have to have, yeah, yeah. Exactly what Justin said. But on the right of the equal sign, so these are just alphas, sorry. So you would just say that alpha is the eigenvalue, alpha is the eigenstate. Um, and they're just gen gen general numbers. Uh, and then this is the, the ket A, and this is multiplied by the same C that's over here. And this is gamma. Um, but yeah, so it's just, you apply some operator to it. Now, what I should say is you can also write these, so when you first learn quantum mechanics, so you'll be learning quantum mechanics and the first semester is usually like learning a language, right? Because these things don't, aren't like intuitive to a lot of people, okay? So these, one way to think about this is a vector, right? You can think about it as a vector. More specifically, you can think about it as a matrix, an n by one matrix, right? Where you have some group of values in an n by one matrix like this. And those uh, make up the state, um, or they make up the, the, the state, right? Those are a description of the state. So for instance, if we wanted to have a z, a plus z, so that's spin, and there's only two spin options, spin up and spin down. So we might rewrite this as something that looks like that, you know? So a, a, a two by one vector, or a two by one matrix, excuse me. You must be an alpha physicist. <laughs> no, I don't even know. I don't even know what I am anymore. A uh, qubit physicist, I guess, would be close enough. So yeah, so we can write like that, and then the z, the minus z state for reference would look like. Oh, this is rough. Zero, one. There you go. So it looks something like that, right? Where we have spin up and spin down, and those are just. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so then uh, this is what we would what we would find here. So it's a, a plus state and a minus state. You can move up or, or you, yeah, you can represent it in the vectors like this. Uh, and then you could write something like this if you wanted to write some state that had both of them in it. Uh, you could write it that looked like this. Uh, so you'd have some psi state. Could be written something like C plus C minus. And that would represent both of them. Okay, so those, you can think of them as vectors. Sometimes it's easier to think of them as vectors. And then uh, when you first start learning and then soon you'll start translating it and realizing that states are easier to work in. Um, sometimes it's a lot harder to, uh, it's a lot harder to understand. Uh, it's a lot harder to work in vectors once you start seeing very complicated and large vectors. So the states are easier to work in eventually, so. Um, let's see, anything else? Yeah, so we could talk about a bra now. Uh, so we talked about the cat, so now let's talk about the bra. Uh, a bra looks like this in Dirac notation, and if the cat is an n by one matrix, then the best way to think about a bra might be a, a one by n matrix, where you, you just have different values for each of the positions along that matrix. Um, let's see, so yeah, so then, uh, so the bras and, uh, so bras and cats, you can think of them, you can multiply them together, uh, and we call that an inner product. And, uh, this is going to be an element of the complex plane. Um, and you might think to yourself, this looks like a dot product. But there's a little bit of a difference between this and a dot product. Namely, that the dot product, or that the uh, um, that inner product uh, can be rewritten 
as its complex conjugate, right? So if you wanted to switch these numbers around, you can't just, you know, get the same thing. You can't just write alpha and beta because they're elements of complex plane. If you switch them around, it's the complex, it's the complex conjugate. So the actual, these two things are actually equal, but like I said, you can't just flip flop back and forth like you might think. So there's a little bit more to it than just the dot product, but the inner product is really how we're going to talk about um, measurements and how we get what we want. So let's talk a little bit about the stern gerlach setup. The stern gerlach thing is how most quantum mechanics courses are started. Uh, unless you start with Griffiths, I guess Griffiths doesn't really do uh, stern gerlach But there's some weird things that happen with stern gerlach that are definitely worth discussing. Uh, <clears throat> and really emphasize how weird... I've been looking at this stuff since 1988. That was the year I was born. Um, okay. So, if we want to talk about uh, the stern gerlach system, we can think of it as a magnet setup. So you'll have a ma two magnets like this, and inside you'll have some particle beam. Yes, now, Griffiths does you liar, liar, pants on fire. He does start like that? Not this new fangled physics? You haven't gotten to quantum yet in your education? Gotta be coming up soon, Beta. Right? I thought you said you were a third year or a second year? Maybe not. Um, Pluto is a planet. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah so you'll be there very soon then beta cool um so these you can think of as a magnetic field and what's going to happen there's a magnetic field running in between the two magnets and what's going to happen is the particles are going to uh split and there'll be some detector and there's going to be two areas right here on the screen right and the two areas basically indicate that half of the particles, well, we'll find out that's half the particles. Half the particles go spit to, to uh, are spinning up and half of them are spinning down. And when they interact with this magnetic field, there should be a, a force, right, that will send to, that will send the particles either up or down, right? Lenz's law. Now, um, <clears throat> so that goes into the spin thing and everything like that. So then what does it look like if we were to just talk about the SG or the stern gerlach system. Well, if we send it in there, what's really happening is now these particles are going in, they're not measured, it's just a, a total randomness of particles, and then they go through here and they become sp spin up and spin down as they exit this, the, uh, the apparatus. So they go into a stern gerlach system and they come out either spin up or spin down. So if we're gonna put a slit in the bottom, right? And we can do this physically, that's not a hard thing to do. Thank you, Tyrion. We can measure that if we sent n particles in, <coughs> then we'll have n over 2 particles here and n over 2 particles here. It should be half and half, right? And uh, these ones will have the spin momentum value of h bar over 2. <coughs> and we can send them in, and these will have Why negative h over 2. Things get a little bit weird. Purple, <laughs> purple I gave. Welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you for the follow. So if we were to send this one into, a, into uh, the same orientation, let's draw this a little bit more cleanly, SGZ. So if we were to send it back into an SGZ machine, what do you guys think would happen? So we blocked off all of the, the, the spinning down particles. We put a screen here, we collected all of the spin down particles, and now up here is all of the spin up particles. So what do you think will happen if we were to measure again what beams are coming out of here. How many particles would be in here? How many particles would be in here? So if we have n over 2 going in. How many do we expect to come out? <clears throat> Half change or spin. So actually, you might think that right off the bat, but since this is you in the same basis. You get more while you collect results. <laughs> Tyrion, stop. Um, so if we take the SG and block the downs and we have only the ups coming in, then actually zero particles come out of the down and we still have N over 2 up here, okay? So N over 2 with a spin in the Z direction uh, equal to H bar over 2 for positive spin, okay? The same out, yep, same in, same out. Now, what happens if we do something a little bit differently? So then this is where we get into... What Mandrew just asked, what if we do the same SGZ setup, 
but this time we're going to block the bottom again. This time, instead of going into an SGZ, we're going to go into an SGX. So think about changing the orientation of the spin. Okay. Now, if we have N over two particles going in, or I'm sorry, if we have N particles going in, we block it off. We have N over two up here, spin up. How many particles do you think come out of the Y or in the, of the SGX machine, right? And it is exactly what Mandry said, what you would expect. You actually split this in half now. So you have N over four, N over four. Okay. So that makes sense, right? If you have, please hydrate physics, dad. I did hydrate. Do I have to hydrate again? <laughs> Welcome to the channel. Things get a little Thank you for the uh, the second reminder. It's not rum, by the way. It's just water. Okay. So. <clears throat> uh, okay. So now where were we? So now this is again, but this is S X now. H over two S X because now we're in the spin in the X direction, negative H over two. So that's the value of the spins. But yes, now we take half of the particles go in, and it gets split in half again and reoriented in the X direction. This is not too weird, right? We changed the orientation. The particles, they are basically saying, okay, now we change the orientation. We split them back up, okay? This is not too weird, right? It's, it's a little bit strange, but you're just saying, okay, well, out of that N over two particles, if we think about the X direction, then half of them are still going up or down in the X direction. It doesn't matter because it's perpendicular to the Z direction. So whatever, right? Who cares, okay? But no, it's weird, right? <clears throat> okay. So now, if we put n particles into an SGZ and we split them up and cut off the bottom half again, so now we have n over 2 particles going into an SGX. And now we're switching orientations again to the SGX, but this time we're going to cut off the, X, the, the spin down particles. So now we have n over 4. Here we have SZ with the value of h bar over 2. Here we have fx with the value of h bar over 2. And this is going back into an SGZ machine. What do you think will come out the other side of the SGZ machine? OK, so yeah, so what, what's, what's the deal? So if we put in n over 2 well, and we put an n over 4 in here, what do you expect to come out here? Well, we already cut off the, all of the SZ spin down particles. We cut them off. There were zero spin down particles going into the, ooh, I have this wrong. I'm sorry, nobody said anything. SGX, sorry. There you go, Mandry caught it. Oh, so did Soon TM. Thank you for that catch. Stir fried crazy, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes, good job. Completely missed that. Um, okay, so now we have N over two going into SGX. The spin down is cut off for the SZ direction. Here we have the positive n over 4 particles because we split them up again. We cut this off again. So now we go back into the SGZ. Remember here, if you put in the negative, so if this was SZ is equal to negative h bar over 2, so those are the particles going that we're cutting off. Here, none of them come through. So what do you think happens in this last one? n over 4 then. Hey, Rooster, good to see you. So you get two multiverses. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> so here, here we have n over eight. It's it's an interesting. So we 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 could talk about. This would be a good example to talk about the uh, the many worlds interpretation. Um, which is just saying basically that you have that you have the wave function of the universe is becoming more entangled by, uh, by splitting it, by trying to take measurements of the system. So there's, it's, it, it's completely, <laughs> it's actually pretty legitimate. Right, minus and minus are in this one. Yeah, so, so the minus does show up in this one, right? We get half of these particles now, make it through, but instead of the SZ minus h bar over two being cut off like they are down here, for some reason, when you reorient in the SG and then reorient it back into the SGZ, you get them again. But why? Like, there's no, there's no, there's nothing weird going on here. So then what, what uh, people did is they said, all right, what I'm going to do is put this entire thing in a box. And I'm not going to look at it at all. Let me get the actual thing so I don't screw this up. 
Uh, <clears throat> it's basically what it does. It's a, it's a thought experiment, but it's basically the same thing where you can reorient the particles in a closed box and not have any type of idea of what's going on. And the same thing holds true. It's, it's like a very, it's like a very odd thing. If you, if you don't, if you, this thing holds true, excuse me. <clears throat> if you don't see what's happening in the center here. So if we don't know what's going on here, this is not true. This is what's true, regardless of what happens inside the box. So if you were to close off the box and then make it randomly change so you don't really know what's going on, then what happens is this, if you were to take a measurement at the end here, this is still gone. So what we found out, and that's the modified SG machine, is basically like, yes, if you randomize this stuff and you don't know what's going on in here, then there's no, there's no addition to this. It turns out to be just like this. So it's weird. We almost have this thing where if you're not watching, not watching it can change the outcome of the experiment it kind of gets into the uh, quantum uh, what's it called the delayed choice the quantum eraser experiment where like a, uh, depending on whether or not you understand or whether or not you know at the end of the experiment uh, what polarization the light will have you still won't be able to measure the polarization uh, earlier on if you can't if you don't measure at the end so it's a, it's a weird experiment I highly recommend looking up the quantum eraser uh, experiment on PBS FaceTime. We're probably not going to watch it today because we still have to get into this quantum chest deal. But it's a great video to watch. Um, any questions about this, how this weird stuff, how actually looking at a particle can change, or looking at the experiment can change this, but if we box this off, close it up in some sort of modified experiment, then we won't be able to know what's going on, and the end result will look like this instead. Um, and again, that's called the modified SG, SG device. So how do you express this mathematically? Oh, um, that's a good question. We can go back to the board really quickly. Uh, so mathematically, you would say some, so we could talk about the different variants of the SG uh, matrix. Ooh, like that. Thank you for the follow. Andy Coley. Cowley. Sorry if I said your name wrong. But yeah, so you could write the matrix like this, and this would be an, an operator, right? The operator, the same A that we had here. So you could apply this operator to a state. So for example, if you wanted to measure SZ applied to the plus Z state, oops, and you want to think about it like vectors uh, <coughs> and matrices, then what you could do is write the plus SZ multiplied by, or plus Z multiplied by the SC. So that would look something like you'd have H bar over two times one, zero, zero, minus one, right? I know this is bright over here. If it's too distracting, I can get rid of it. And then uh, you could, oh, you have to write the vector too, or the, sorry, the, the bra or the cat. And then if you multiply it out, what you end up getting is the uh, 1, 0 times h bar over 2. So it's h bar over 2. And then the state again, plus h bar over 2. <clears throat> and we would call this an eigenvalue of the eigenstate plus C. So when you do the vector, the matrix multiplication, you would go here, this would be the first value, this would be the second value. So this still turns out to be the same thing where it's one zero and multiplied by plus H bar over two, okay? <clears throat> Quantum math, there we go. So that's how you would express it mathematically if you wanted to measure like the, if you wanted to find the value of the spin um, that's how you would write it out. Again, like the matrix and the vector notation may seem a little bit, uh, the may seem a little easier in a situation like this where you just have a two by two matrix and a uh, two by one vector. But uh, it, 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 like I said, it gets really complicated really quickly. And eventually you're gonna have giant matrices with all sorts of weird things going on. When you start to consider tensored, part, uh, tensored states together, 
like the entanglement states and stuff, you're gonna, this is sloppy. It gets harder to deal with. It's a lot easier to just think in cats and bras eventually. But that would be what the math looks like if you want to figure out like how to take a... Uh, so soon asks, how do we measure spin? So uh, we measure spin based, based off of the angular momentum, the spin angular momentum. So there's all of the angular momentum is calculated, right? You can calculate the angular momentum of a particle. You'll have the uh, linear angular momentum from the, from the particle orbiting, and then you'll have the spin angular momentum. Again, spin is a really complicated topic to talk about because we don't actually know what it, the physical particle, what the particle is doing physically. Um, it looks like spin, but we, it looks like the, it's a, a particle, a ball spinning, uh, mathematically, and, and like, uh, but it doesn't look like that physically. It, you run into all sorts of problems like uh, radiation of energy, speed of light travel, or speed of light spin, rotations and whatnot. And there's all sorts of issues when you start to introduce, when you start to think about a particle actually spinning. Um, but it has all of the, but mathematically it looks like spin, so we call it spin. Uh, but yeah, so measuring it is just measuring the addition of uh, orbital spin, and, or orbital linear momentum with spin momentum, and getting the total angular momentum of a particle, of like an electron in an orbit or something like that. Um, but as far as the experimental methods, I'm not 100% sure how you would do that experimentally. Professor Melko would probably know how to do that experimentally. I unfortunately do not. <laughs> 